Here's my question for you to get this ball rolling. What does nutrition have to do with theoretical physics? You might say nothing. It certainly seems that way when you just look at the surface of the situation. Like, what does nutrition have to do with theoretical physics? Doesn't seem like much. I mean, maybe you can come up with some sort of explanation such as like, well, in the end, the chemicals which are part of the food that you eat, you know, those are made of atoms, and that's what theoretical physics studies. But that's a, it's a very tangential relationship. And see, many theoretical physicists might take this approach. But consider, and this is especially true now that I'm going through this fast, and I've been experiencing it myself, you see, the food you eat very much affects how your brain and your mind work. And if you're a theoretical physicist and your whole life is all about thinking and using your brain and your mind to develop new theories, make profound new connections, have insights about deep aspects about the structure of the subatomic realm, It's very important what you eat. Because like I've been fasting for the last seven days and it's, it's, it's amazing how differently my mind functions without food in some positive ways and in some negative ways. But if you told the average theoretical physicist that nutrition is very important to science, he might just dismiss you and not take that very seriously. Because the sort of traditional scientific materialist attitude towards science is that, well, but, but Leo, me as the scientist, I am not relevant to the issue of what's true and what's false. And so if my science is good, if my physics and my physical theories are valid, it doesn't matter what I eat, I could eat junk food and the theories would still be true. Yes, in that limited reductionistic sense, you're right, but the theories that you're able to generate and even the theories that you're able to understand very much depends on your nutrition. So if you're a theoretical physicist or any scientist, I'm. I'm, we just took the theoretical physicist here as an example. It doesn't matter what scientist it is. It could be a biologist. It could be a psychologist. It doesn't matter. Whatever scientist you are, see, when you're being taught how to do scientific method, they teach you all about the method and how to do your lab work and so forth, but nobody teaches you that in order to do high-quality science, you got to do good nutrition. You personally, because you see, there's this, this sort of assumption this dualistic assumption that, well, the science is one thing, and then you, as a scientist, that's a separate thing, and in fact, we want to try to extricate ourselves from the science and act as this neutral third-person observer. We want to be objective. We want to be neutral. But actually, there is no neutrality when you do this, because if you're going to separate yourself from science, and you're going to say, well, my personal life doesn't matter, and nutritional is just part of my personal life, but it does matter because the quality of your science depends upon it. What your mind is able to understand, how conscious it can be, very much depends on nutrition. Which is why some of the most advanced sages and mystics and yogis from the dawn of time have practiced fasting because it has a profound effect on, you, on, your, on your consciousness what you eat. And also why the most conscious people also tend to have the highest quality diets. See. In fact, if you're a materialistic scientist and you think that all this mystical schmistical stuff is all just nonsense and fairy tales and wishful thinking and bullshit, the reason you think that is because you don't have direct experiences of having had mystical experiences or meditation, you know, breakthroughs and spiritual insights, 
But the reason that could be the case is because you eat garbage. And you're overweight. And that junk food is clogging up your, your, your whole physiology. Your whole nervous system is affected by that. And it's limiting your ability to be conscious and to recognize and have these profound experiences. And so, of course, then you just dismiss them as fairy tales and nonsense and superstition. But that's because you're not making a holistic connection. So why are we talking about this? Holism, right? <laughs> you need a, a holistic understanding of the situation to see the connection between high quality science and your own personal nutrition. Because you're not going to be able to understand the best science when your nutrition is bad. And of course, it's not just nutrition. It's also exercise. It's also the kind of toxins and medications you put into your body. All of these things have a, an effect on you. And of course, not just that, but many, many other factors that I won't belabor here. You get the point. You see, so this is sort of the essence of what I'm trying to communicate to you about holism is that when you adopt a holistic attitude towards all of life, it's a game changer because many of the problems and obstacles you used to have, you can start to see them from a higher elevation perspective and solutions become available that cannot be resolved at the level that you were thinking about them at, at the sort of reductionistic level. Many of your problems are literally stemming from a lack of holism. But you don't always see it. In fact, often you don't see it. And it needs to be pointed out to you, which is why we're taking this time to point this out to you with ample exam uh, examples and so forth. Because it, it, there's sort of a, a shift that I want you to experience in your mind where you start to say, holy shit, holism is extremely important. And people are not talking about it and taking it seriously enough. When we say holism, people can just say like, oh, well, it's some sort of hippie idea of, you know, Mother Earth Gaia sort of thing, or it's some sort of holistic food idea or holistic medicine idea, some sort of alternative medicine idea. But it's not that. Those are just little offshoots and branches from the, the massive tree trunk of holism that, that I want you to really focus your attention on here, right? Um, When you adopt this holism attitude, you start to see life in a very different way. You start to see all these different situations in a different way. You start to make interconnections between things and you start to see how this domain of life and that domain of life are really connected. But up until now, you've been treating them as, as totally separate and distinct things. And that's why you were not getting the best results here or the best results there or wherever. And now when you're starting to interconnect them, now you start to see how one informs and connects and affects the other one. And then you can wrap your mind around the whole thing. And then you can see, ah, now I see why I was stuck for all these years. Hitting my head against a a glass ceiling. It's because I wasn't interconnecting things that are actually deeply interconnected. But I was treating them as though I can just, you know, compartmentalize this from that, you know, science from nutrition, nutrition from psychological well-being, psychological well-being from my relationships. I, I thought these were all separate things, but it's like, no, they're not separate things. That's the key thing I want you to understand.